Hello, everyone. Welcome to this roundtable. I'm very happy to see so many people today and still coming in. Um, first, maybe, Eric, would you like to tell us a bit about the Miwell Association? Since you were the co-founder, I think you can say a little bit more than me about it. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, Miwell, uh, also known as a, a, me, a mental well-being community uh, in Zurich, um, is a student-led nonprofit uh, for Ryan, uh, based here uh, around the ETH community. Our goal is to provide mental health awareness um, uh, and uh, especially fight a lot of the mental health stigma that exists within academia. So we, we provide mental health awareness, um, such as events like these. Um, in 2019, middle of 2019, um, uh, myself and, and Mo, uh, but both of us uh, AETH at the time, uh, co-founded this initiative from, from an idea phase. Uh, then we, we slowly brought it into, into the project that you see today. So uh, recently I, I've, I've stepped down from the board. So, so now I guess I'm a quote unquote alum, <laughs> alumni <laughs> of Miwell, um, but it's really nice to be here uh, and, and talk a bit about today's event. Yes, thank you so much for being a speaker as well today. So today we're going to talk about a subject that all of us heard about before, failure and perfectionism culture, and mostly in academia because um, we are the three of us in academia and uh, that's a topic we can talk about. And today we will have so this discussion between Richard, Eric and I about how do we perceive failure, what can we do to overcome failure? Uh, what are like the um, coping mechanism to overcome failure and to go on in life? What do we learn from those failures and, and so on? So really feel free during this uh, round table to uh, of course listen uh, and to participate as well. If uh, our speaker are agreeing with it, you can maybe ask questions during the talk or you can also share your own story if you if you feel like it. It's really up to everyone to decide what they want to share during this round table or not. So maybe first uh, you guys can uh, introduce yourself. Richard, do you want to start? Sure. Lorraine, thank you very much for the invitation. And Eric, uh, it's great to be speaking in this roundtable with you. Uh, my name is Richard John. I am, uh, I, I, I have this tendency to say I am an, you know, ex fifth, sixth year of PhD student because, uh, from, from back in the days, but I just defended my dissertation as of last week. Uh, so I'm a freshly minted uh, doctor. Uh, but I, I, I used to be a a PhD student at uh, MIT Mathematics. I'm calling from my office right now. Uh, my research focuses on healthcare uh, and AI and um, among uh, other directions uh, of, uh, of research. Um, I started the uh, Fail Inspiring Resilience here at MIT, which focuses on destigmatizing failures in academia and other hyper-competitive uh, places. And uh, we're very excited to be partnering up with Miwell uh, in, at ETH Zurich to be speaking to, and I like uh, to a wide range of audience members and talk about uh, mental health failures and, uh, and, 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 and uh, success in, in academia and beyond. So really, really excited to be here. Thank you so much and congratulations on your PhD defense. So now we have to call you. you Dr. Zeng from now on on the whole, uh, <laughs> the whole run table. Okay, so are you, Eric? Your turn. And likewise, Richard, um, it's really great to be here talking uh, and, and I'm, I'm really excited about the discussion that we're gonna have today. Um, a little bit about myself. So uh, similar to Richard, I recently finished my PhD. Not as recent as, as, as Richard though, I finished at the end of January. Um, I'm from the United States originally, um, and uh, from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I did my research, I did, my, I did a PhD at ETH Zurich in the field of artificial photosynthesis. Uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to report that I have a wide array of failures under my belt uh, that I, I can talk about today. Um, um, uh, luckily, some of them turned out, turned out better than, 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 than for the worse. Um, over the past 10 years, I've uh, sat on or founded around eight organizations. Not all of them are listed on, on LinkedIn because again, I've tried 
quite a fair share of failures. <laughs> so, um, but but I'm, I'm really excited about today's uh, today's event since I resonate a lot about the topic, and I think that there's a lot of things around this topic that should be discussed more within our academic environment because uh, not everything you see, not not all the successes you see are are, are straightforward. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. And me, just for a quick introduction, uh, my name is Lorraine Madur, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Zurich. I'm working on depression and more particularly a certain type of neurons that would be involved in the certain um, symptom of depression. And, uh, and yeah, I'm part of me while I'm uh, organizing those roundtable events and uh, the goal of those events is to uh, share knowledge about different concepts, share a very personal experience so everyone feel like they're in a safe place and we can really share everything in between us without any judgment, without any mm -hmm. stereotype or anything. So yeah. yeah, we can start now. I think we are all set. So which one of you wants to first start sharing his own story? Okay. Um, <laughs> how much time do I have, Lorraine? Uh, take your time. No problem. Okay. Can I can I can I share slides or? Uh, yes, of course. Yes. Okay. I because I prepared I prepared some slide deck for for all of us here and. Uh, That's wonderful. Thank you very yeah, much. And for the time, I would say maybe not more than uh, 20, 20, 25 minutes. So here we can. Yeah. Yeah. No. I'll, I'll be I'll be done before that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Sorry, my computer is slow. It's taking its time. Great. Um, or actually, let me let me sorry, there's one small tech. I'm sorry about this. Just because I have a PhD doesn't mean that I really know what I'm doing when it comes to technology. If if you ever come to MIT, you you'll realize how um One second. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, once, sorry about this. All right, I'm not gonna use my earphone. Can you, can, can you hear me? Yes. yes. I still hear you, loud and clear. I cannot hear you all. Mm. Sorry about that. All right, can, can, can you try speaking? Yes. All right, all right, per perfect, finally. Okay. Um, all right, not gonna try to be fancy then. Okay, so um, I guess today I've thought about uh, what to call my sort of little little talk of, uh, of failure or fail. So I, I decided to kind of talk about uh, this particular uh, experience of me uh, getting rejected by 60 jobs. And uh, for, for those of you who are out, uh, out there who are uh, uh, either looking for jobs or who will be looking for jobs in the imminent future, I hope this might be relatable to you. So a little bit, just a very quickly, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I did my undergraduate, I, I was, uh, I immigrated to Toronto, Canada uh, when I was in, um, in uh, when I was 12 years old and I stayed there for middle school and high school until 2011 when I moved to uh, New York uh, to pursue my undergraduate study at New York University. That's my uh, bottom right is my favorite show, Phantom of the Opera. I've watched it probably like six, seven times when I, during my time in New York. And, uh, and then between my college, uh, during my college, I've done several different research experiences at uh, UMass, University of Massachusetts Amherst, at, Rhode Island, at uh, uh, University of Rhode Island, and also at Aalto University in Finland. So my first European experience uh, is, uh, is in Northern Europe, which is very uh, atypical of, uh, of a first intro to, to Europe. So at, at three, the three different universities, I've done very different research. I've done 
So at UMass Amherst, I did research in molecular biophysics. At uh, University of Rhode Island, I did research in physical tomography. And at uh, Alta University, I did structural mechanics. And then after all of that, I decided to come to MIT to pursue my PhD in applied mathematics. And uh, this is where I have uh, spent the last five years of my life. And uh, immediately after graduation, I'll be joining a venture capital fund called uh, Pair VC out in Palo Alto uh, to run the accelerator program. And uh, Pair is an early stage uh, venture capital fund um, uh, focusing on, uh, it's sector agnostic, it's done investment in uh, several different uh, companies, including DoorDash and, and Dropbox and Gusto, which you might have heard. Uh, DoorDash IPO'd last year, and our partners, Mar Hersherson and uh, Pageman Novat, um, made it to the, the Meet Us list, which is the top uh, VCs list, um, which is Forbes' top VCs, uh, one, top 100 VCs around the world. So uh, at this point, you are probably annoyed by, by, by me and be like, well, what is this guy doing here just showing off his achievement? So where where is the failure in all of that? And I think really that's that's and that's what I would like to discuss today. So here I, I listed a here's an incomplete list of my failures. So we can we can go through that. Um, when I, back in 2011, when I applied for colleges, I actually got rejected by most of the colleges I applied for. So I got into Boston University and NYU, and I decided that I want to be in New York rather than Boston. But I ended up in Boston anyway uh, for my PhD. Uh, I, my, my thesis focuses on partial differential equations, uh, but I remember the first PDE test that I took, I got a, th a 35 out of 120 and that's 30%. I don't know what is, you know, how 30% looks like at, uh, at ETH, but uh, uh, in, in, in NYU, it looks pretty bad. And I think it's pretty bad in, 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 by, by any standard. Um, I, I applied for 60 jobs and I didn't hear back from any of it. So it's not like you got 60 jobs, I got 50 interviews, and I didn't, I didn't get any offers. I applied for 60 jobs, 60 plus jobs, and I did not get uh, any interviews, just no interviews, right? Um, I applied for, when I applied for graduate school, I applied actually for 11 graduate school, and I got into one, and, you know, only MIT accepted me. And, uh, and this might be relatable to, to some of you in the PhD program that you wanted to drop out of PhD, right? So at one point, I was pretty sure I was like, this is not the thing for me. I wanted to drop out as well. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, and it's speaking of my personal relation, I got myself involved in a very toxic relation with someone that almost destroyed my career. And, uh, and you know, we can, we can talk about that offline, but probably not here and, and et cetera, right? So the list goes on. And for today's talk, I would like to focus on uh, the fact that I got uh, rejected. So yeah, I didn't update the slides, it says 50, but yesterday when I did the counting, actually it's a 60, 63. Um, I would like to talk about my job, uh, job application failures and uh, my, my, my uh, tendency to, to drop out of PhD. So wh where do I begin? I, I really enjoy science like many of you, and that's what brought me into, um, into, into the PhD program. And back when I was an undergrad, I was really, really, really focused in academia. I spent probably 12, 13 hours a day in the, in the library. This is the NYU uh, Bopes Library. Um, and this is where I spent the four years of my time in New York. Um, and by the way, if you notice that there are these bars uh, kind of blocking off the, uh, block, blocking off the, uh, uh, the, the hallways, if you ever wonder why, that's because someone used to, I'm not kidding, someone used to commit to suicide by jumping off the windows from here. And uh, yeah, mental health is a, is a big issue in, at, at NYU. And they would jump off from the window down to the atrium. So they decided to just, you know, seal the whole, uh, uh, the, the gap so that people cannot jump down from here. Right. But I spent, I spent four years here. I really, really focused on academia. Uh, I did not really explore New York City. So probably if you are a tourist in New York, you know more about New York than me. I know, I know everything about this, about NYU and where the strongest Wi-Fi is. And I, I've, I've been to probably, I've been to bars like five times in New York during the four years of my time there. So next time you're in New York, you should be my tour guide because I really don't know too much about the city. Um, and, you know, but, you know, the, the hard work pays, pays, paid off and I got into MIT, but but fine. But around the same time as I apply for graduate school, I also apply for jobs, right? Because you always want to be, um, uh, want to be, uh, you know, prepared. And guess what? I I got I applied for sixty 
plus 63, 64 jobs. And I, I got, I, all of them got rejected. It's not like, and like I said, it's not like I, I got some interviews and some of them said no. It's like I did not hear back from the 63 jobs that I applied for, right? And, you know, that, that was, and that was a really, I would say for me, it was a really traumatic experience. You know, I worked so hard for four, for the past four years. Um, and I thought I had the impression that, you know, I, I, I should have jobs lined up for me, right? And, and no, that's not really the case. And fine, you know, I, like I said, I got into MIT and that was the email that I received on uh, the acceptance into the MIT mathematics PhD program. And I was really, really happy that day. But I, I had this nagging voice inside my head, right? Like I worked so hard to get into, to, to finish the degree uh, at NYU and to, got in, to get into MIT math. But, you know, there's a nagging voice is like, what exactly went wrong? Why is it that I have a, such a high, that I had a really high GPA, that I worked so hard that I couldn't get, find a single job, not even a single interview. And will I ever find a job? If I continue down this path at MIT, will I ever find a job, right? And what should I do, do differently so I, I don't end up driving Uber? I, I, I don't know if this is, uh, Uber is a, is a phenomenon in, uh, in, I don't know if Uber is, is legal in, in Zurich, but uh, it's pretty prevalent here in the US. And I always have this uh, have the imp impression that sometimes sometimes I feel like you know I, if I, if the, if this test doesn't work out or if something doesn't work out I'm gonna I'm gonna be driving an Uber um, or or Lyft or or delivery pizzas right so how should I do it differently so that I'll have a job and not end up driving Ubers okay so what I did in the first two years of my PhD is very atypical I think a lot of uh, students came into uh, MIT program the MIT PhD or any PhD program energized and wanting to be like, okay, I'm so ready to do work. I'm so ready to kind of just jump in and, and you know, crank through a lot of research. But for me, no, uh, for me, there's this nagging voice inside my head and there, these are the questions that I wonder. So actually for the first two years of my PhD, I didn't do too much research or even I didn't, I wasn't really focused. I was just doing a lot of coffee chats. I was chatting with a lot of people. I was doing a lot of soul searching myself uh, to, to really know what I wanted to do and how, what, what I did wrong. And at one point I was like, yeah, you know, I don't think PhD is a thing for me. I really, I really wanted to, to leave. So in terms of coffee chats, just to show you like how crazy I got with coffee chats, like the left hand, left hand side, you see a, like a typical schedule of, of my day where I kind of just lined up, you know, different coffee chats, you know, career, career conversations. Uh, you know, there's, there's some classes that I took, but really clear conversations, um, you know, with mentors, and and things like that and on, on the right hand side I, I, that was my i remember that was my first attempt to a good friend a friend of mine named Dagoric ing who uh you know who who graduated from harvard and then he went on to pursue a, a mba from harvard and after working at bcg for a few years and now he's working as a professional counselor career counselor so i kind of so i kind of reached out to him and uh looking back on this it's still kind of funny i didn't know how to write a formal message uh, or email it was kind of broken and yeah and uh but that was the, that he was one of my uh my closest mentors and uh, we we worked very closely in the in the past few years but that was you know and these these are the kinds of outreaches that i did uh in the in the first two years and in terms of soul searching i went to a lot of random events like I went to a dinner with the, there was a there was a dinner being organized with the professor. I, you know, I went out went out to the dinner. I talked to him. He he teaches uh, electrical engineering. I'm not an electrical engineer, but you know, I think he's cool. So I went there. I attended a lot of random talks. For example, here's a here's a talk with on U.S. Russia relation with the foreign minister of uh, of former foreign, foreign minister of Russia, Andrei Yatsin. I went to a, a seminar on how scientists should run for office and a workshop on tree traversal. Uh, algorithm, right? So I did a lot of like random, random walks in the first two years. And at some point I was like, should I, should I drop out? Should I not? You know, and at one point, you know, I, I was, I, I just, because of all the nagging voices in my head, I just stopped finding uh, the research uh, that I, that I, you know, I'm paid to do so interesting because, you know, I just keep on thinking what went wrong, what went wrong. But as I'm doing those seemingly aimless random walks, you know, like things, things come together. And I, at the end of the day, I decided to stay, All right? So I, I wanted to share with you a few 
few things I learned out of that out of that ran, random walks in the first two years, and then we can talk about what I did after that, after those random walks. So, so what went wrong, right? What what went wrong? Why me, a uh, an MIT PhD, was not able to find jobs immediately after graduation? Why is it that uh, sixty job applications did not result in a single interview, right? So I, so I, I summarized my mistakes, and here are the, the th I would say here are the top three mistakes that I made. The first mistake that I made is that I applied online and applied online only. The truth is, online applications are useless, right? Um, I think when you, I, I don't know here, and I don't know in Zurich, but in, uh, in, in the US, when you apply for graduate school, you kind of apply for a common portal, right? There's a common portal you can submit your applications to and, you know, and then you hear back. So I thought that was the rule of the game for, in, for, for jobs as well. So I applied extensively online. But the truth is online applications are useless. You don't know if the jobs are still active. You don't know if they're posting it just because they need to do so by law. But whereas they, or, or whereas they already have, uh, have, have an internal appointee, right? So instead of what I, sh what I should have done, I should have networked, networked and networked. I should have gone to events. I should have gone to panel discussions to show my faces and really present myself, right? So that was the first mistake that I made. What was the second mistake? The second mistake was that I didn't try hard enough to sell myself because I used to be under the impression that, that as long as I do good work, as long as I, I work hard, people will notice me and people will notice my skill set. And the answer is no. Good work isn't good until you show it. Right? There, there should be an active uh, marketing effort. So what, should, what I should have done is I should have been tailored to my audience. I should have shown my work, how my work is relevant to the audience that I'm to, to the employers I'm talking to, just to give you a sense of how bad I was, I used to be at selling. Uh, this was a resume that I that I put together for uh, so when I was a second year. I was applying for uh, I was applying. Actually, I used the same resume. I I, I applied for a Goldman Sachs uh, equity uh, researcher position, and this is the 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 kind of resume that I put together. And if there's one thing you want to note is that this. This, this glaring thing that stands in front of you called a research statement, right? I've been developing a computer model that simulates the molecular self-assembly of biological filaments where I applied Monte Carlo algorithm with stimulated annealing, and it goes on, right? Do you think that, uh, I, I used to think that, uh, you know, an HR from a finance firm reading this would be able to see, would be able to see how much of a star I am. Nothing could be further from the truth. And by the way, Nobody ever told me that to remove this. I, I gave this to the career center counselors, and they say, "Yeah, this looks cool, right?" So that, then you know, sometimes you question what um, what these career counselors do, but that's that's a story for another uh, another day. But I was not tailoring. To, I was not tailored to my audience. I thought this is the good, great work that I did. I gave it to anyone; they're going to be able to see the merits behind it, and the and uh, the truth couldn't be it couldn't be uh, the truth couldn't be further from that. So my third mistake was that uh, my background back in the days was too academic. And, and industry, so first I, I'll phrase it in, in terms of industry. And industry employers don't care too much about, uh, you know, the, spe the technical specific method that you're using as opposed to the big picture and how they can be applicable to, uh, to the work that they do, right? And, you know, I, I would make the extension uh, to, uh, to academic work as well, right? When you apply for academic jobs, chances are that you will not be able to fit uh, strictly within your uh, domain, your, the area of research for, for the job that you are applying. So how should you diversify your background a little bit so that it can be connected to, uh, to, to, to the specific job and so, so that people can see what values you can bring onto the table? You know, that, that's, another, that's another point that I did not address. So, I changed my approach, and I, I, I would say these are the three things that I did after extensive soul searching, and after I decided to uh, stay uh, for uh, for my uh, for my PhD, is I aggressively networked, I proactively communicated, and I widely diversified, right? And and below, I you know, I like right right after I realized all of that, I, I started working. Uh, on you know some some of the uh, working towards those three uh, objectives. So you know these are some of the stuff that I did, just to name a few. But you know before I before I conclude, I, I just wanted to quickly you know tell you a little bit about uh, the fail uh, inspiring resilience conference that I put together. So 
what was what was the idea, right? Like I, I I'm I, I consider myself an overachiever, and I have many many goals in mind, and I oftentimes help myself to a to a high standard, such that whenever things like getting rejected by sixty plus jobs happen, it was just like you know it's not supposed to happen. Failure is not supposed to be an option. Like I'm I'm so so you know I I will, I was like I'm I'm a complete failure. You know I'm completely useless. So. And and then you know I, together with the, with a group of friends at MIT we thought what if we decided to host a conference to showcase people's failures and that's exactly what we did we hosted the conferences where we invite uh, uh, established professors and individuals to come and speak about the failures uh, and it turns out that I'm not the only one who got rejected who who experienced these sorts of traumatic. Uh, you know, uh, you know, harsh failures like getting rejected by so many jobs. But there are so many people who, uh, you know, manage to uh, be successful in different ways, have experienced failures in their in their early stage. Uh, so the you know these are the sort of just a few pictures to showcase the kind of failures that uh, the kind of conferences that we organized, and and you know we we curate these talks and and quotes from from people like uh, like the ones being featured here. So uh, just to just to name a few, you know, Alan Adams uh, was very big on. He he was he 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 transitioned. He was a theoretical physicist before becoming a an oceanographer. And you can imagine just making such a huge career jump. He experienced so many so many so many failures, and uh, in the process where the little things that uh, that will make or break your experiments in an experimental setting, well, you know, th those are the kinds of things that he personally suffered from a lot. And by the time when he was giving this talk, he was, per he was undergoing some major catastrophe in labs. Um, and so that was, this was the first fail conference that we organized. And then we just went ahead with organizing uh, a, a quite a few. You know, this was, for those of you who recognize, George Church is uh, one of the, uh, you know, sort of the founding members of modern synthetic biology. He openly shared the fact that he got kicked out of uh, a PhD program at uh, Duke University before spending six months being homeless, just living in a lab. Um, and uh, moving on to, you know, sort of the next fail conference, this was Susan Silby. He, she's a stellar anthropologist, uh, anthropology professor at MIT. It took her 16 years or seven, actually 17 years to finish her PhD, not seven or five. I mean, I finished in five. It took her 17 years to finish her PhD. So for those of you who are, you know, seven years in, you're like, you know what, you can still be an MIT professor uh, after 17 years in, in graduate school. And uh, who else? This was Regina Bateson. She was in a political scientist at, uh, at MIT. And around the time that she gave the talk, she was going to leave MIT because she was she lost her job at MIT because she uh, at the same time as she was working for towards her tenure, she decided to uh, run for office uh, in, uh, in 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 the congressional uh, election in, in back in, back home in San Francisco, and she didn't win that election, but also she ran out of her tenure clock. And uh, you know she 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 lost her job at, at that time. So you know she also openly it was a, she she gave a really emotional talk uh, around that uh, you know during the conference. Um, so so we went so we went ahead and you know organized many many events. And um, I think uh, Lorraine, you get what's the time? Like 20, 25 minutes. Uh, it's been twenty minutes. So maybe if. Uh... I'll just, so I'll just a few more details and then we can yeah. go on to what Eric will share with us. Sure. That's sure. I'll just quickly, I'll skip the video. We can, you can when I look watch my... the video online. So I'll, I'll just quickly share you know, sort of a few things about, so what have I learned from the 60 plus job rejections and the ensuing activities during my PhD? And here's a little hint, not a lot of math. I didn't learn too much, so much math during my time at PhD. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, fine. I learned how to differentiate Lagrange polynomials of the second kind, but you know, that's not the main point. And by the way, if you've been to my defense, you probably, you heard this from before, but, uh, I was with my advisor and couldn't say everything, but so here you, here we're, we're going to, I'm going to give you the uncensored version of what I have learned, uh, during my PhD. So the first thing that I re really, that I learned from all of this experience is that you don't know what the fuck you're doing most of the time. And that's completely okay. Right? I, I think 
whether you're pursuing research or you're doing trying to do a startup or trying to be innov trying to pursue a very innovative path, oftentimes you just find yourself lost. Like I, when I was going through all the soul searching and doing all those random talks from politics to uh, to algorithms to uh, uh, to, to God knows what, you know, I, w I was completely lost, but that's, that's fine. You're walking down an innovative path. You are re rediscovering yourself and it's completely fine to be lost. Uh, pat yourself on the shoulder and give yourself an easier time. The, the second thing that I would say is regarding mentorship. And this is a quote from uh, Professor Alan Adams at MIT Physics who gave the first failed talk. And that is f find the mentors that are good to you, not just brilliant because brilliance is cheap and good is special. Okay, I think in, in, in modern society, we, we kind of praise and we worship to people who are smart. And many of you may relate to the experience about like when you're choosing your PhD advisors as to why are you choosing him or her? Because, oh, he or her, she, he or she is so smart and I just worship them, right? And I, I think really in a good research institute like MIT, Harvard, or ETH, or Zurich, you know, everyone is brilliant. If you think, think about the professors, all of them are brilliant. And brilliance is a cheap commodity, okay? And I know this is controversial to say, but brilliance is a cheap commodity and is no longer the sole judging criteria. We don't need people who are smart. We, don't, we need people who can, who can be good, who can be kind to their students and who can be there when students need them. Right? So that, tells, that says a lot about the kind of mentors that, um, uh, that, that you should choose. And we can, we can talk more extensively on that. And the, th the third one is about coffee chats. It's, it's, uh, the, the quote goes, get into as many, ca many coffee chats as, you, as possible. And if someone offers you coffee, let them buy the coffees because chances are that someone else bought them coffee when they were in your position, okay? And, th and that's what I did in the first two years. And that's something that I continue on, continue doing. I think academia is a pretty siloed place and you oftentimes just care about the little fields that you are in. You know, so by the time that you apply for jobs, whether it's academia or industry, people will ask you about the broad implications. So you got to get, get out of the little silo, the little worlds that you're in. And that was the little world that I was in when I was in New York, right? Uh, and uh, kind of spending 13 hours in a library. You got to get out and, and talk to people and, uh, you know, let people mentor you. Let people, let, let people show you the way. You don't have to do everything yourself. And the uh, number four, and uh, the next thing that I want to want to highlight is uh, if you don't like how the table is set, then turn over the table. This is a quote from one of my favorite characters, Frank Underwood. And I want to make a disclaimer that I'm talking about the character, not the actor. Um, and um, I don't know, like uh, I think I, I felt very much stuck in my first year of PhD, right? Like I was lost. I'd be like, sure, I'll finish a degree, but am I going to find a job? And I didn't like the situation I was in. So, and there are rules about, oh, you're supposed to be dedicated to research, you're supposed to be an academic, you know, you, you are, you're in a PhD, obviously you want to be a professor, right? You know, I'm sure you have heard that from a, a lot of from professors, and if you ever tell them you want to be in industry, they get really mad at you. But I don't know, you know, like, I, I, like, I, like, there are hard rules that you're supposed to follow, like don't kill people and, you know, you're supposed to finish your dissertation and, and stuff like that. And there are soft rules, like you're supposed to be a professor. No, you're not. You're supposed to do whatever you want to do. All right. So don't this feel stuck in this current situation. And I'll just be very quick with my last. <laughs> maybe and very, very quick, because now it's going to start to be a bit, maybe a little bit too long for Eric uh, to have time just, until eight to, uh, to discuss yeah. as well. And I'll just very quickly say, one last thing, and that is uh, that is the following from the, my favorite quote from Ellen DeGeneres is that life is like one giant Mardi Gras, but instead of showing people your boobs, show people your brain. And if they like what they see, you have more bees than you know what to do with, and uh, you'll be drunk most of the time. So I spend a lot of time trying to please people, trying to pe shape myself to be someone that I'm not. And uh, at the end of the day, I realize it's not really worth it. And with that, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and I apologize for going over time, but uh, Lorraine and Eric, I'll let you take over. I uh, don't apologize, it's all fine. It's just so we are sure we stay in the, the good time for Eric to be able to discuss about his failures and all of his experience. Yeah. But thanks a lot for this presentation. It was really great and very well organized. Like. I think we never had presentation before and it was really uh, a change and like I said we have something visual I think it's really uh, it's really interesting and the way you are talking about all of those things you, we can really think, feel that you are passionate about what you're doing now at fail as well also and it's really nice to hear thank you.
and that's a lot of great advice. I mean, for me, I'm going to take them for myself first off. And then, uh, so Eric, do you want to share with us your experience with those nice failure in life? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, first of all, also, th thank you, Richard. This was a really, really great informative presentation. Um, and, and actually, we, we overlap in quite a few places, uh, 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 kind of coincidentally, which is uh, pretty neat. But I'll, I'll talk about that, I guess. Um, over over my, my my points here. So, um, unfortunately, I, I I don't have a presentation. Um, and but I think to to outline a bit of my points. Um, what I'll say though is that, you know, my, my my goal here isn't to show you know people here on this call, um, how you succeed, uh, how to succeed, uh, or I or how I have succeeded. Um, but rather, what I want to show is how I've come to be more comfortable with failure. Um, and uh, specifically uh, how I think that becoming comfortable with failure has uh, made me a better person. Um, so what, what do I mean by that? Uh, I, I think, you know, to, to be I guess more, more, specific, more specific, I can get into a few stories about my, my past. Um, so uh, to, to follow a similar strain as what Richard did, um, you know, I, I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, the center of the agriculture belt in the United States, um, to a family of scientists, um, and uh, you know, kind of as a as as such, coincidentally, was able to get early access into the laboratories. I've been in research laboratories since the age of sixteen. It isn't because I'm brilliant; it's just because I had access to it. Um, and luckily, I, I came from a privileged family that was able to, to uh, le uh, let me uh, do laboratory work while I wasn't being paid. Uh, not everyone has opportunities like this. Um, but um, I, I, think, I think that there's something kind of, you know, for, from there, uh, I've been able to do so many things. I was kind of writing down a, a list of things that I've done. And I think a, a lot of that also, uh, interestingly, has a lot to do with uh, American culture um, and how a lot of American culture uh, to, to be kind of frank, um, doesn't build much shame. Uh, <laughs> um, we, we, we have, we have uh, you know, of course, we, a lot of people would describe it as confidence, but I would say that we have less shame. <laughs> I wouldn't say we have necessarily more confidence. Um, you know, I'm looking back and, you know, in my undergraduate, when I started my undergraduate in North Carolina State University, um, I was in 11 different organizations. Um, I, I founded an organization, the uh, Mo Model United Nations there. I, I really love getting into politics. Um, was doing undergrad research during that time. I, I uh, studied in China. In fact, actually, I, I, I uh, had a paper that came out of my research in China there uh, during that time. Um, I was in uh, you know, five different music ensembles, uh, some of which I started, some of which, uh, again, you won't see because I started and, and they didn't turn into anything. Um, I, I did a lot of things. Um, I did many, many, many things. But again, that the point is, is that I didn't anticipate. I, 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 I didn't anticipate all of them needing to succeed. I, I didn't start them because I felt as if every single thing had to be a success. Um, rather, um, I think I, I started things because I, I wanted some things to succeed, um, and. Um, one thing in particular that I think that changed quite a bit, though, is that, you know, of course, I, I was also involved in a lot of different organizations. Um, I, I did a lot of things, um, uh, and, but, but, but uh, what, what one, one thing that did change quite a bit, though, when, when I entered my undergrad, similar to, I think I would say, Richard, is um, I, I, I didn't honestly have much of a social life. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't go out much. I didn't do much. And honestly, I, I, my personal development was very, very minimal. Um, but something I think that purpose that did change quite a bit and, and one of the key points here that I guess one of the catchphrases that I'd like to kind of launch is um, don't be afraid to be a fool. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I realized is that while I was trying to get engaged in a lot of these different activities, um, I didn't know how to get what I wanted. I, I didn't know how to interact with people. I didn't know how to make friends. I didn't know how to do the things and I didn't know how to develop myself into a person that I wanted to be. I didn't know how to talk either. So one of the things that when I look back, you know, I could ignore all of these organizations that I did, uh, every single success that I had in life. I think one of the key things that I did that made the biggest difference with myself is um, in, my, in my undergraduate, uh, I would 
you know, I didn't know anyone. Um, and so I would sit down at lunch. I would go to the cafeteria. I would sit down at lunch and I would try to find someone that was sitting by themselves. Uh, and I sat down, you know, I, I would go up to them and then ask them, hey, uh, can I have lunch with you? Can I, can I eat dinner with you? Uh, are, are you by yourself? Uh, and then we'd start talking, you know, what's your name? How are you? Where do you come from, et cetera? And, and slowly these things started to turn into projects. Slowly they started to turn into connections. Slowly they sort of started to turn into other opportunities. 90% of the time, these events and these interactions made me feel like shit. Uh, I felt awkward. <laughs> it was uncomfortable. But slowly over time, stuff started to work out. You know, people all around the university thought that I was this popular kid who knew everyone. Um, honestly, again, it, it, it feels kind of funny looking back and people telling me this in retrospect, because during that situation, doing all these organizations and everything, I was just trying to figure out how to socialize, how to get along with people. And it was uncomfortable. Um, but I think that, again, I wouldn't have been able to develop and become a better person uh, if I didn't try to take that step and become uncomfortable. Uh, I'm not great. Of course, uh, uh, it takes practice. Um, as, as I said, you know, I was in 11 organizations in my undergrad. Um, I've launched many, many, many projects since. And most of them you won't see any indication of uh, because I, 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 this isn't stuff you put on your CV. Um, but again, it, it isn't because it doesn't exist and it isn't because it didn't contribute to where, where I am right now. So um, I think I'll leave off with that. Um, don't be afraid to be a fool. Um, I have a lot of other things that I'd be happy to talk about, other projects that I've done um, that, that contribute to this mentality. But um, otherwise than that, I'd, I'd be happy to have a conversation. Thank you so much. This is really helpful, I think, to also know that, you know, you can try to launch multiple um, project and organization. It doesn't have to work right away. It doesn't have to, but we feel that we have to do perfectly things because if we don't, what do we look like? We are ridiculous, we are being ashamed and we don't want to look to our surrounding like, oh, he really believed in this project, but then it didn't work out. So, you know, it must not be for him. So I feel like from both of your uh, stories, I really appreciate this will of continuing, not giving up on it. Like just, okay, it didn't work. Well, I feel like shit. I feel like a fool, but then at the end of the day, I have another project coming in and then I have another idea and then I'm gonna continue to try because I don't think everyone is able to do that sometimes. Sometimes you're like, oh, I, I tried this, but then it's not for me. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna leave it and then leave it to someone else. But you both really continued in the same thing. And that's crazy. Like you really had this resilience of thinking okay, this is not working now, but then I can try something a bit different there and then something here and then I'm growing with it. And you are this like way of telling yourself, well, I'm growing with it anyway. So whatever I'm doing, it's, um, it's adding to my maturity as a person and as a researcher, if you want to do research or whatever. So I really feel like those stories are really interesting for that, just to show that, okay, some stuff didn't work, but that doesn't mean that I have to stop in my field. I can just continue and try something else, try some new ideas, and it doesn't change the value of you as a person. And nobody should make fools of you anyway for not like uh, launching one thing or another thing. You know, it's, uh, it's really, uh, it's really a uh, interesting topic. Do we have like questions in the chat, uh, Eric? Um, well, I, 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 like, I like the comment that Sammy brought up, um, which is, you know, you, you always try and you always fail, but I guess you want to make sure that the next time you feel better, <laughs> this is how you slowly improve. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree with that as well. Also, because I have to say, uh, from a personal point of view, I feel like in science, when we talk about less about project, but really about your own PhD project sometimes and your own like um, experiment, sometimes it can be very difficult to say, okay, I build up the protocol, everything. I know that it has, if I do that, it has to give me this result. And then you don't get to this result. And then you feel like, 
okay, um, I have to find another way to go around. And sometimes it still doesn't work. And sometimes you can have like years. Some people, it's like years of trying something that, that is not working and that's a PhD. So you need to give something at the end. At the, at the end of your PhD, you need some data. Sometimes it can be so frustrating and you can really feel like you are not made for it. But in fact, it's not about even about like research or a project association or whatever. It's not about if you if you are capable or not. In fact, you are capable, but sometimes you're not like made for this exact thing. And then you need to just shift your perception on it and then take another look and then try again something different and then come back to it. And then it's all a um, question of resilience and just trying to find how you fit in it. And then I feel like when you, you start feeling like you fit, you are like way more proactive and then this failure and everything, they doesn't seem as big as they would seem in the first place. I don't know if I'm like expressing myself correctly or not. Yeah, well, I, I, I think I think I resonate with, with, with some of what you say, um, but but I think what one thing that I, I do want to make clear, at least from my side, is um, not necessarily. I mean, resilience, of course, is very important. And, and perseverance, of course, is really important. But I think it's also important to realize when when, when something isn't actually worthwhile <laughs> as well. Mm. Um, and this is something, you know, why, when I talk about having a lot of projects, um, you know, so sometimes uh, there's there's projects that you know it's won't work out for the amount of, it won't work out for the amount of time and effort that you should put into it. You know, I know Richard mentioned something about um uh, having a difficult time with the phd and 99 percent certain that, that you wanted to quit well i actually quit uh i i started a phd project um when i came to eth i was in a very very difficult situation with the supervisor um and i quit uh and then i i started over again uh at, at the pulse I'm, I'm not you know i understand that, that that situations are very complicated and i don't advocate for everyone to quit <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, you know, the, there's a fine, there's a fine balance, but I think it's, it's important to understand, you know, when something is actually worth the effort or not, you know, in these situations, though, when I do quit, of course, it feels like shit. And of course, uh, I can, I can consider myself feeling like a failure. But most of the time, I try to distance that and say, okay, rather than thinking about it as a failure, this is just not worth my time and energy. Let me focus on something else that I can do. I think the topic of, you know, working smart versus working hard is worth probably worth another seminar on. But I, I really agree with with uh, with Eric that sometimes taking a step back is just as important as taking steps forward. And I think personally, when I was an undergrad, I have had many difficult moments with the classes that I wanted to take. You know, I wanted to excel. I wanted to do I wanted to take the most difficult class just because I'm a masochist and just because I wanted to. Uh, prove to the rest of the world that I can do this. And while sometimes I can, sometimes I just have to, you know, take the prerequisites before I take, you know, the, the, the advanced levels in order to, uh, to succeed. And if I jump directly to the advanced level, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to suffer tremendously. Is that the best? Did I grow out of it? Absolutely. Is that the best use of my time? Maybe. Uh, does that, uh, uh, does that uh, you know, uh, is that the best learning, uh, best way to learn? Uh, I doubt it. And is that the best for my, is that best for my mental health? Absolutely not. So you got to evaluate the situation accordingly before uh, you make the decision as to whether you want to stay, uh, you want to stick to it or not. Yeah. And, and, and I think, I think also similarly, um, being more comfortable with failure and, and uh, also, you know, re reviewing the situation and seeing whether it's worthwhile um, having these feedback mechanisms and being comfortable with, with failure makes you more, uh, makes you, it makes it easier to deal with uncertainty. Um, and since uncertainty is, is such a key point, a uh, key component of, of uh, uh, having, it has such a key impact upon mental health. Uh, I think being more accepting of failure is, is something that helps, at least it's helped me quite a bit for my mental health. Yeah, that's for sure. So now does, Everyone has any question for our speakers or want to share with us their experience, maybe? It's not mandatory, but if you wish, set the time. Okay. Then Eric, Richard, do you want to 
ask questions to each other <laughs> or share some last thoughts on it. Also, um, Eric, do you have the link for some feedback that we can send to the chat? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we can we, we can put that into chat in in a little bit. Um, and Stella, have... Stella uh, sent um, a question. Thank you both for sharing. What did help you to cope with the frustration and to try again? I'll let Richard go first. Yeah, I, I think dealing with the sort of the, the frustration, I think that's the, because sometimes when things don't work out, you feel, you feel really, it, 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 feel, it, it really sucks, right? Uh, and uh, you feel like you are, sometimes you feel like you are, uh, you're not gonna get through this. I remember, so, uh, you know, the other, another story, which I will, uh, the other story that I will share later is, you know, uh, later on when I applied for uh, jobs, you know, as I was considering dropping out, I actually applied for, for further jobs. And at this time I did get some interviews and some of them went well and others went horribly, right? And there are jobs where I'm like, I, I think I'm going to get this job. And then first round in, you're like, what the fuck just happened? And sometimes after those interviews, I'm just, you know, sitting here. And I'm just stuck, like, like I couldn't move my legs because I just feel like stuck. I just like, what exactly just happened? I could be sitting here for two hours. You know, I feel frozen. I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, fro frozen in time. Yes. So, you know, those moments do come up. And um, I try to take a day off when those moments, when those uh, unexpected uh, failures uh, take place. I mean, most failures are unexpected. Uh, when, when those, you know, moments uh, pop up, when I really don't feel like I could, I really need a moment to myself, um, and I oftentimes, uh, you know, take take the take the day off or take a half day off to really re to grieve, to mourn, and to reflect on what happened. And I call uh, call around my friends, including uh, one of my favorite uh, people here, Valentina, uh, to really reflect on you know what happened and to have the friend support. And uh, yeah, I, th I think surrounding yourself with mentors, like I said, surrounding yourself with mentors, with friends, uh, and with with loved ones. Families, partners. I think I think those are those are really really uh, important uh, mechanism mechanism to help yourself to help you ride the waves of up and ups and downs in life. Yeah, I I, I agree with all of those those thoughts. Um, uh, I think also from from my perspective, um, I, well, a quick aside. Uh, of course, everyone deals uh, can deal with frustration in in, in different ways. Um, it's of course really important to surround yourself with an environment that's helpful uh, and supportive. Um, I think I think one thing for for me in particular is I, I think I normally you know when 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 things are frustrating or, or can be frustrating uh, I like to have some some anal uh, some some avenue for me to direct uh, time and energy um, because ultimately if I have things that I can focus my attention onto then uh, the the frustrations become less because they they have less. Uh, less portion of the time and energy that I spend thinking about it. So to, to be honest, I think also one, you know, people look at how busy and involved I am in a lot of different organizations, um, you know, over the past four years, I'm six organizations. So I am very busy, but I think at the same time, interestingly, by being very, and I don't necessarily advocate this for everyone, but by being very busy for me has allowed me such that there's always something that I can do. So something gets stuck, something always gets stuck, but then, hey, you know, there's something I can work on right now and I don't even think about it and I don't have time to actually think about other things. Um, I think, of course, it's really important to make sure though that if you are really busy, that then you can manage uh, work-life balance at the same time um, to make sure that things aren't overwhelming. But um, at least for me, this is, this is one thing that definitely, definitely has a big impact in reducing my frustrations is having more a diversity of things that I can focus on. So I'm not just overwhelmed by one thing in my life, which is difficult, I think, in a PhD in particular, when people oftentimes feel consumed by their PhD, but really try to make sure that there's other things that you're doing in life, because life isn't just going to be your PhD. And I would like to add on to uh, what Eric said. So I think keeping yourself busy and, you know, performing, you know, multiple uh, functions on top of your, uh, on top of your research position, I think it has a benefit of constructing a different identity for yourself, right? If you center uh, your identity around, I'm a researcher or I'm an academic, then if academic doesn't work, then 
yeah, that's the only identity you have, which just gets to destroy, quote, quote unquote, destroyed, at least temporarily by your failures. If instead you have other side projects or even you have your hobbies, right? So you say, you know what? I'm not sure I'm an academic, but I'm also a florist. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm also a dancer. I'm also a singer. I'm also uh, the managing director of uh, this and this organization. Well, at least those things are working and I, I still get to retain those identities. Uh, and and uh, yeah, no, I'm, just not, I'm not just a researcher, but I, I, I wear multiple hats and they're, they're just, they're, they are fine at the end of the day. Yep, and, and and to also quickly add onto that as well, um, I, I think then it's it can easily you can easily have the thought that okay, well you know I, I do research all the time. Yeah, well, are there actually other things that I'm good at per se or or, or, or want to be? But I think that at least for me, uh, it's it's difficult. But 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 that's not the the question that I try to ask myself. It's more that you know what am I interested in? And if I'm interested in it and I'm not good at it, then just try it. Like just, just do it. <laughs> um, um, have the lunch or coffee chats with people, become better at communicating because I want to become better at communicating. And slowly over time, um, it, it, it can get better. And then if it doesn't get better, then try something else. <laughs> so so this is, this is how, how I think being more accepting of failure and being okay to be a fool uh, makes me myself a better person or, or makes you feel like I've become a better person. You don't have to know what you're doing all the time. Most of the time, <laughs> don't you don't have to. No. I, most of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. And like I said, that's, that's fine. Yeah, but, but try to do something though. Yeah, yeah. yeah for sure. Can I oh, sorry. The famous fake it until you make it, right? That's what you say in the US mostly. Well, uh, kind of, but I want to be careful because, uh, you know, the idea of, of faking it can also be easy to, at least for me, it can be easy in bringing up the idea of imposter syndrome as well. Like, I don't want to have people, you know, feel as if they're, they're just, they're, they're an imposter all the time and, 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 and pretending. No, 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 no. Thing. But, but, but yeah, but certainly knowing that you're trying something and knowing that you are a beginner and being okay with that, that you're going to fail, um, but, but you can get better over time as well. So. So sorry about the quick aside. It's just that I'm not I'm not the biggest fan of that phrase because I feel like it's implies a little bit that that's that you have to fake it. But I think you can know that. No, me. I see it more as like um to help the self confidence. You don't have confidence to do something. Well, try to do it. Yeah. I see the fake it as like do it, do it, do it, do it. Even if you think that you're not doing it like properly, and then it will bring the confidence because. When you will make it, you will realize, oh wow, well, I was doing it this whole time, you know? Not like fake it, like do something fake to show that, <laughs> that you did it. More like this idea of you try, you try until you can look behind you and you saw that in fact you did it, you know, and it, it was fine that you were capable of it. Mm -hmm. To be like more like a self-confidence. But yeah, I guess there is different uh, point of view on it. I, I would actually encourage everyone here who thinks that uh, you know who has experienced some failures or setbacks lately, just to realize how far you, you uh, to realize where you are currently and to look back on how much you've accomplished, right? Back when you were, I don't know, 18 years old or, or 19 years old, or maybe, or if you are at that age, look further back and see, you know, how long of a, how, how long of a journey that you have become, uh, you, you have come to this point. And uh, as, as much as you can, as far back as you can look uh, you will also be able to uh, look for look forward and project how far you will you will walk uh, down down in the future. Thank you so much for that. Maybe we can cut the recording, Eric. So maybe we can talk a little bit offline if uh, you want to share some more personal stories that you don't want it to have displayed on um, Spotify or YouTube. So before you stop recording. Thanks a lot, everyone. It was my pleasure to have you both in, the, in this roundtable. I think it was a very interesting one with a lot of um, very interesting story. And I want to thank you both for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.